You'll check the, there we go. Everybody's down front and looks so cool. We're almost in one section. And that's okay. It's good to see everybody. If you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 is a very important passage in the sense that what we talked about this morning in, in, in John 1, and the reason I say that is because of the fact of what he is, he's going to be speaking about. Paul coming out of a situation in his life where he was a Jew among Jews. He was, uh, he was, he, he was not someone that was uh, excited about Christianity. In fact, he was ready to, to kill Christians. He wanted to get rid of them. He did not believe what we believe as far as Jesus being who he said he was. And then there's that great transformation on the road to Damascus when God appeared to him in a bright light and he said, who are you, Lord? He knew. You know, there's just, there's just that, that understanding. I know this is not normal. And whenever you have the kind of faith that Paul did, he knew, guys. I mean, he knew. There was no doubt in his mind. Walking down the road and all of a sudden, you, you know, when you see something you can't explain and you have a faith like Paul had, wow. He knew who he was. But in his defense, he said, who are you, Lord? Because there's always that possibility that it could be something other than God. I don't think that's what Paul actually meant. But if we look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Since then you have been raised from, with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life now is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Let's pray. Father, we have a lot of things in our lives that we're thankful for. We're thankful for times when we know you are so much a part of our lives and we feel so comfortable in you. And there are also times, Father, when we don't feel so comfortable in you. When we allow our human desires, our sinful nature, lead us to where we don't need to be. And though, Father, we mourn those times and we, we, we look at them and we carry that guilt around, Father, we, we know that your Son's blood purifies us daily, hourly from our sins. Thank you for that. Thank you for all that he has been for us through that sacrifice, that atonement for our sins and for the opportunity we have to be called your children. It's in his blessed and holy name that we pray, in the holy name of Jesus, amen. 
This morning, the uh, sermon title was in the beginning, and we talked about who Jesus was. And I, I want to carry that on a little further this afternoon. And I want to ask you a question, and I want you to answer it honestly in your own mind. Does he really matter to you? Now, whenever I was growing up, J.D. Lancaster was our preacher, and J.D. always talked about the Sunday night core Christians. You know what I'm talking about. We're, we, you know, a lot of people, you started coming on Sunday nights just to be considered part of the core group. Uh, maybe that was just a ploy, Bill. I don't know. I, I kind of wonder about that. You know, do you say that and try to encourage people to come? I, I, I don't know that that's true, but I do know this. Even though sometimes we may be considered by some the more religious, the more faithful, the more righteous, we have to ask some questions and, and look at some things very carefully. I mean, we call ourselves Christians and we're good at proclaiming the gospel. We insist on teaching a doctrine of justification through faith and, and understanding that we defend the inerrancy of Scripture and look forward to eternity. In a word, we're pretty good at doing that. We're pretty good at doing that, emphasizing our fundamental beliefs in Scripture and, and the power of prayer and our relationship with God and, and doing things the right way, the right times. But many times I think we fail to emphasize the horizontal connection with Jesus and all that he has accomplished. And by horizontal, I mean, I have in mind our ethical and, and, and sociological ob obligations to the people around us such as the pursuit of justice, opposition to discrimination, ministry to the poor and homeless, and we could go on and on, but sadly, many of us as Christians view such things with more than a little doubt. We're fearful that too much involvement outside the walls of this building will eventually weaken or dilute our commitment to the basic command to save souls. And you know what, I've, over the last several months and years, I've seen that to a certain extent become true. And so I wanted to bring that up this evening because I think that sometimes we need to contemplate where we stand spiritually. Do we really hold to the faith that we proclaim? Do we really hold on to those core beliefs? Do we, do we really acknowledge them? The Apostle Paul makes it explicitly clear that our new life in Christ has to do one thing, and that's be an example to the world. When Jesus gives us the opportunity to teach, whether it's in a relationship style where we're dealing with people that we know, in a society of people that we have a lot in common with, or if it's the same type of deal where we're teaching those who have no concept of what we believe, and we still have to do some things very carefully. I believe, and I believe I always will believe, that we should teach Bible things. I don't think we need to fall, walk away from the implicit review of Scripture on a daily basis. And so many times I think we've caught ourselves believing that we've got the answers and therefore, why to study anymore? We'll never get to an understanding of having it all together. And I don't mean that to say that we don't try. I'm saying that a lot of times we pride ourselves in having conquered the sins that we find in Colossians 3, 5, 8, and 9, but really many of us still harbor that prejudice and disdain for people who don't belong with us. Did you know there are people who don't belong with us? When I first became a Christian, I didn't understand that concept. It had to be taught to me. I was amazed as a young man whenever my, I was, and some of y'all may have heard this story before, but whenever I was in second grade, my little friend's name was Tommy Johnson. And Tommy and I got along real well. We were best buds. And I was always one. I said, Tommy, you need to come over to my house. He said, well, I live too far. And, and I said, I oh, know, you know, I said, but, but we, need to, you know, we need to do something. So one weekend I said, hey, look, i tell you what. Why don't you come and spend the night with me, and then we'll play all day Saturday, and and and, and we can take you home and and uh, because see Tommy went to church, and I didn't know what church was and didn't really care. I mean I knew what vacation Bible school was, but I didn't care much for church. And he said, you know that that's all right, but he said, I said I'm going to ask my dad. So I went home and I asked my dad, and I said, Dad, can Tommy Johnson come spend the night with me? He said, Well, sure. What you need to do is just have him 
dad call me and make sure that everything's all right and he can come over and, and, and stay. Now, take into consideration that in second grade, I was born in 1959 in, East, in, in western Louisiana in Shreveport, which I would I will debate with you that it's really supposed to have been East Texas, but um, depends on which time of the war you were talking about. And I was born post-war, so I'm not going to worry about that either. But Tommy, I gave Tommy my phone number, and Tommy took it to his dad, and Tommy's dad called my dad, and he answered, I remember dad answering the phone, and dad said, uh, yes, this is James Farmer. And he said, uh, you're Doc Johnson? And I saw the anger in my dad's face. He said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And he hung up the phone. And he turned around and looked at me, and I was hoping that I, Tommy was going to get some spend the night. But see, Tommy's daddy was the black doctor in town. And in 1966, that just wasn't the right thing to do for a white boy and a black boy to be friends, much less spend the night together. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Kind of dumb. We stayed friends. But I thought my dad was going to kill me. I really did. He said, I can't believe you embarrassed me like that. I grew up understanding that there was a difference, but Alex, how many fingers do you have? No, you got 10. See, there is a difference. You, that new math is getting me, buddy. I'm not sure if that, huh? Oh, it's summertime. He's got to be retrained. Oh, we all do. Okay. What about you, Daniel? How many, how, many, how many toes do you have? Well, see, I haven't checked because you wear shoes most of the time. I just wanted to make sure on that. I knew the answer for Alex is. But see, that's all I knew. Is we all had two eyes. We all had a nose. We all had ears. We all had hair. We, we had smiles. We had teeth. We could eat the same food, go to the same schools, and do the same things. But it bothered me that my dad did not understand that he and I were friends. I didn't care what color his skin was. He and I were friends. And, late, and, I, and I'm glad that it's gotten to a point where it's now a thing I feel like, at least in my family, and uh, for many others, it's a, it's a thing of the past. But there's really a lot of people in our society who still harbor that prejudice and disdain for people of another color, another race, a lower social status. My dad was, uh, I, I was raised oil field trash. Y'all remember that one? We lived in a, you know, I was white trash. We lived in the trailer park. We didn't take the wheels off. You knew that that was the wrong kind of people. If they took the wheels off, they planned on staying a while. They, you know, you, that was okay. But if you left the wheels on, you watch those people. Inferior educational degree, your less affluent economic stature. I worked for a church one time that told me, we don't want those kinds here. Paul simply states, we won't stand for it. And I'm thankful that I'm, I'm at a congregation, bless you, darling, I'm thankful that we live, I live in a congregation and worship with a congregation that doesn't have that problem in the sense of color. I, I, and, I, and I told the elders that when I got here. That is one thing that I have always watched for. And I appreciate that. However, I've not been a member of a congregation ever that didn't have some type of prejudice that didn't show its ugly face occasionally. I made a promise to J.D. Lancaster many, many years ago whenever I became a Christian that whenever I saw injustice, I'd try to take an evil and vicious swipe at it with the sword of truth. Because the Bible teaches that all men are the same. No matter their, econ uh, their uh, economic status, the color of their skin, their education, or anything that we use in our society to separate us. One of the greatest elders I ever had the opportunity to serve under as a minister had a fifth grade education. One of the best shepherds I've ever met. 
he loved God and he loved God's people. We as Christians are to be a new humanity, a new way of life, a new and different people. That's what we have in Christ. There's no Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. We just read that in verse 11 of Colossians 3. And I believe that most of us believe that, but you know, what, how does he make that statement? Why does he make it? Because in one spirit, we are baptized into what? One body. Jews or Greeks, doesn't matter. We're baptized into one body. Slave or free, we're baptized into one body. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, we all, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Yes, it needs to be stated. Again and again, lest we deem it as secondary or unimportant. In Galatians 3 and verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for, all, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. No one is any better than anyone else. Paul's point is really easy to understand here. He isn't saying that Gentiles literally became Jews and, or vice versa. He isn't saying or suggesting that slaves are no longer responsible to their masters or that women are now men. In the case of slavery, the application of certain biblical principles would lead to slavery's demise, would it not? These ethnic, cultural, sexual, and social distinctions don't automatically just go away. They just don't matter anymore when it comes to our spiritual standing with God or the blessing and promise that we inherit from him. In the body of Christ, race is irrelevant. In the church, social status is irrelevant. In the body of Christ, immoral sexual behavior is not tolerated. In the body of Christ, it shouldn't matter what culture you come from. All that matters is that these people are now brothers in Christ. In Colossians 1, in verse Two, it says, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. He made no distinction to the brothers in Christ. What distinction was it? Holy and faithful. That's the only distinctions that we see. It didn't matter what their social status was. It didn't matter if they were Jew or Greek. It didn't matter where they sat on Sunday morning. Or the East Siders or West Siders are part of the Central Church. You know, we've got Far East and Far West. And then we've got the Near East and Near West, and then we've got Central. Most of you are members of the Central Congregation tonight. Far West and Far East are not. Some of y'all have uh, moved already, so thank you. All that mattered is that these people were now brothers, united in Christ. And isn't that what we're supposed to be? Doesn't matter who we are. Doesn't matter where we live. Doesn't matter how much money we make. Doesn't matter what we wear or, as one young man said, who your daddy is. Paul condemns such all, all such discrimination for the very reason that the only thing that matters anymore with us should be are we in Christ? Are we his? The same Jesus with whom you died and are raised now enables you to live as a new life. A new man, new woman that you are. He indwells both Greeks and Jews, both educated and barbarian, both slave and master, male and female. Now, now, now let's be clear about one thing. Paul isn't talking about our merely believing this to be true, okay? He's not saying just an acknowledgement. He's not saying, yeah, just agree with it because that's what the book says. You can, you can say that we're all one in Christ all the while you retain the prejudice against a person because of those things that we've discussed. Maybe you fail to fight against the efforts to perpetuate those old stereotypes and our responsibility 
But what is our responsibility? Our responsibility, indeed, our joy is not simply to declare this truth, but to work diligently in the church and the society to embrace and affirm that we are all one in Christ and Christ is one in us all. We should and must liberate those who suffered from the lingering effects of those divisions and the discrimination that energizes them. Again, we Christians grew up singing Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. But at the same time, many still wonder perhaps he loves some more than others. Perhaps the red are more precious than the yellow. Maybe the white gets spiritual perks withheld from those of a different color. For years, the whites thought, white Americans thought that we were the chosen people. That God took favor to us. I want to tell you something. That's gotten us right where we are today, spiritually in our nation. Because of that, that very thought process. Paul's not talking about singing a song, but living a life, perhaps demanding, sacrificial and painful, a life that reflects the truth of what has been accomplished in the work of Christ. So if these factors don't matter anymore, what does? There's only one thing, Jesus. Paul's point in saying that is that Christ is all and in all. The latter phrase that he uses here, in all, is not an affirmation of, Drew, uh, of divine omnipresence nor a declaration that Christ is in all circumstances, providentially speaking, although he certainly is, but rather Christ is in all who know him regardless of their ethnicity, their social standing, or where they stand in where they live. Whenever I was over in the country of Togo and met some of the Christians that were over there, I was amazed at how little in common we had with them. I didn't have anything in common with those people. And I felt ashamed. I was over there to help them. I was over there to see, make sure that they were getting the gospel, but I, thought, I saw so many things. But you know the things that I saw that differentiated us was the very things that Paul describes as being the wrong things to look at. They don't have anything over there. I saw some things that I wished you could have seen. But you know what I did see? I saw my understanding of what this passage is talking about become something that I have based and held close to my heart ever since. Those factors don't matter anymore about status and where they live, or do they need God more than anybody else does? They need God, yes. So do I. But once they have him, they are my equal. They are my brother. They are my sister in Christ. And then it becomes my responsibility to be their brother. And that's something that we don't think about. Well, yeah, they're saved and they're in a the right relationship with God, but you know, I just really don't like to have anything to do with them. But they're your brother. And believe me, I've got a brother that I used to not have. I didn't want to have anything to do with him. I didn't want to have anything to do with my mother for years until somebody came by and slapped me and said, hey, by the way, did you realize that she's your mother? Oh, really? Oh, yeah. She's your mother. I'm thankful for that. Whenever Paul writes that Christ is all, who, or in all who know him, regardless of where they are, he no less believes Jesus is in the Gentiles and the Scythians, and that he believes that Jesus is also in the Jewish Christians. That he dwells in and fully abides with those who were considered to be slaves. And in reality, no less than he did with the freedmen of that day and age. The phrase Christ is in all is not an endorsement of pantheism, as some suggest. And for those who don't know, pantheism is the belief that God is 
God and the material world are one and the same thing and that God is present in everything. Now, folks, Jesus is indistinguishable from what has been made. I, I can look outside, and, and somebody was talking to me this morning. I can't remember who it was, and I apologize for that. But they were talking about someplace they'd been, and they said, if you, could, if you saw that, you, how can you say there is no God? What Paul is stating in no certain, uncertain terms is that Christ is all that matters. We can see him in everything that's made, yes. But he's saying something along the lines of, Christ, you are everything. The young people sing a song, and I wish we sang it more. You are my all in all. It defines what our relationship with Christ is supposed to be like. You're my strength when I am weak. How many times I've needed that strength. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Daniel Brimer once wrote a song entitled, All That Matters Is You, O Lord. You ever sing that, Chris? It's a beautiful song. I, I, I've never sung it. I've read the words. We need to find it and, and do it sometimes. Oh, the words are so beautiful. And he's right. But the question is, is can you honestly say that? Can you honestly say all that matters is you, O oh Lord? Or does the pigment of a person's skin, the amount of their paycheck on a weekly basis, the house in which they live, the car that they drive, the size of their house or how much land they own or what job they have, does that really matter? I hope that we're never so arrogant to say that we know and embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ if we cannot say that in him there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female, rich or poor, black or white, westerner or easterner. And we should never say it. We should never be happy in thinking or saying there is a difference. Back in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Back in chapter 1 and verse 2, he said, they're all in, one in Christ. He says here, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Who is he talking about? Every Christian. Folks, we should never be happy in thinking or saying or believing that there's a difference because of these qualities that the world sees. Not until we can fully grasp that Christ is all and in all can we really be who we're supposed to be Sam Storm stood up in a sermon, uh, during a lesson one time and asked the question, is God all that matters to you? Does he matter to you? Does he really matter to you? Are we teaching a doctrine that God tells us to teach? I believe we are. Are we following God the way that we should according to the gospel? I believe that we are. Are we giving ear to the social injustice and the predisposition of being in the right group in a world in which we live? In chapter 4 of Colossians, verse 1, Paul writes these same people and says, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair. Why? Because you know that you also have a master in heaven. How are you doing? Where do you stand this evening? 
Are we being obedient? Are we being who God wants us to be? And I'm going to use this last verse as we close in chapter 3, verse 12, the very next verse out of our text. Therefore, as God's chosen people. Isn't that great? We're chosen people. Holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you might have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. How are we doing? Are we there yet? How are we doing? I hope that we can take this message today and change our world. Jesus did it with 12 men. And we can with what we have here and knock out social injustice so that whenever somebody sees someone who is different, physically, economically, whatever, that they see through the eyes of God and can say, that's my brother, that's my sister. I am somebody. I am God's child. I am somebody. Because my God doesn't make junk. He makes Christians. If you need to come tonight, for whatever reason, do so now while we stand and while we sing.